the bread of life. Amen. So listen, we, uh, let's go ahead and turn. Um, we're going to go ahead and turn to Isaiah chapter 43, and I'm going to read some of the verses that are connected to my message this morning. So first, we're going to read verses 1 through 2, and then we'll read verses 10 through 12, and then we'll read verses 18 through 19. So here we go. This is Isaiah chapter 43, starting with verses 1 and 2. But now thus says the Lord that created you, O Jacob, and he that formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle Upon you. Now, going down to verse 10, we'll read verses 10 through 12. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am He. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord. And beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. You see that? I just want to read that one more time. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. Now we're going to go ahead and go to verse 18 and 19. Because this is really the majority of my message right here. This is where the title comes from. Remember ye not the former things... Neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just want to thank you, Lord, as you begin to speak this morning about forgetting the old and embracing the new, Lord. We know that you have a timeless message, Lord, for your people, really anybody that's willing to have ears to hear. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would be the one that speaks this morning, Lord, and that I would just simply be a vessel, Lord, a mouth that you would use, Lord. We don't even understand why you would choose to use human beings, Lord God, in all of our failures and faults, but yet that is what you have chosen to do, Lord, to use marred clay as a vessel that you would pour yourself that you would fill into, Lord God, with your presence inside the vessel and pour out of into others. And so, Lord, I make myself available as a vessel and pray that you would use me to speak your truth this morning, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, listen, so forgetting the old and embracing the new. You know, I was thinking in that song right there, whenever it was saying, the night is when the night is holding on to me, God is holding on. And I don't know about you, but whenever music has a, a Christian music or worship music has a very profound effect on me. Like I'm a, I'm a lyric person. Like I listen to the words. I don't really understand the whole kind of like the beat thing. I, I, I have met a lot of people and they explain that, man, I don't even listen to the words, dude. I'm just listening to the beat. I, I've heard people say that, but I've never been that way. So it's hard for me to understand that. I'm a word person. That's what I like to hear the words. Even back when I was in the world and I was listening to worldly type music, I knew all the lyrics to the songs. I don't, I never really understood the beats and all of that. But, but as I'm listening to that song and it's talking about the fact that the night is holding on to me, and, and yet at the same time, God is holding on. If you, you know, not knowing where each individual person is and really what the mindset of each individual has, I'm talking about the way that they perceive life around them, right? And, and I know that maybe sometimes people maybe think I over-explain things, but I try, I do, maybe I do think too deeply sometimes, but I try to imagine in my heart and in my mind the things that I've experienced, and then I try to understand what other people may be experiencing in their life. I mean, that's, I think that's something that happens to pastors at some point in time, like we start getting kind of concerned about everybody else, all right? And, and you know, as, I, as I, we were singing that song, I started to think about my own personal life, my little journey, and I've shared a lot of little elements of my life with many of y'all, but you know, we all have a context in which we were raised. 
You, you know what I'm saying? Like your own family. I've shared that with y'all before. Your cultural, you're different culturally than maybe what I was. I mean, we might all be from Louisiana. We might even all be Cajun. But there's differing levels to our individual family groups of the way that we were raised. And all of that affects our mindset and our viewpoints of life. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? Okay. Because I'm trying to show you that God's up to something on the earth and that he's creating a people for his himself, but that the people that God is creating, it's been a long process, but he's pulling people out from all over the world, and that's what his word said that he was going to do, and I'm just trying to explain to you how we're all kind of coming from, from different areas and ways, okay, and so one of the things when I think of that song, I, I do, I personalize stuff like that, and I can't help it but think about my dad. I know you're probably like, dude, you got to go talk about your dad. I think it was just because he was so like, it, he just had such an effect on my, on my mind and the way that I perceived life. Okay, so I'm not trying to overdo that, but I'm trying to use that as a point to you. So whenever I grew up in the home that I grew up in, you know, again, I talk about my mama's family. I talk about my dad's family because that helps mold and shape your perception of the world around you, does it not? I mean, you can still remember some of you men in here, look, comments that your own daddy spoke to you. And I mean, if we had time, we could let everybody come up here and they could say what their daddy said, but I'm the one that happens to have the mic, so you got to just kind of like for a second, you got to listen to my little story. And so the way that my dad was, and I've shared this before with you, is that he was like a, a, he was a Marine in Korea and he was like an old football player, but really what the, it sounds like what he had fun doing was drinking and going to ballrooms and like sometimes beating people up. And the only reason I'm saying that is because one time I met a guy at a wedding, and I know I've shared this before, but I was like, oh, you went to UL? Well, my dad went to UL too. He said, yeah. He said, who is your daddy boy? And I guess I kind of looked like my dad. And I told him, he said, yeah, your daddy slapped me one time. I'm like, no, I'm just telling you like this is 50, this is 50 years after the fact, a random wedding that I'm in in Lafayette, which is a kind of a big city. And I just happened to run into this one dude that I knew his daughter, and, and he just says, who is your dad? And when my dad's not even from Lafayette, he's from Baton Rouge, and he said, yeah, your dad slapped me one time. <laughs> and I'm like, so I go back the next weekend, my dad comes down, I'm like, dad, like, what, what is going on? Like, I meet this random dude, and he says, yes, he said, I told you don't ever tell nobody who your daddy is, boy. <laughs> and so that's what I'm trying to say. Like, that's just how my dad was. And so basically in my house growing up is like, okay, well, if the night is holding on to you, then you better man up and pull yourself up by the bootstraps, and you better get it done. Okay, but what I'm trying to say is no, dad, because you didn't even do that. See, you had your own way of holding on to something else that was going to try to get you through your darkness. See, you wasn't really quite as tough as what you thought you were. You might have been able to slap a man or beat a man down, but when it came to spiritual things, you didn't know, you couldn't muster up enough strength in you because, see, he ended up having a drinking problem. And so that was just my dad's problem. And I mean, don't get me wrong, I followed him in some of my dad's footsteps. And you also have experienced various things in life, and you have found that when the darkness tries to hold on to you, you will, it's inevitable. Human beings will do it. You will try to reach out towards something else to hold on to that's going to get you through that dark spot. That is a common finding in all human beings because, and so at the same time, people are searching. They're searching for ways to try to fill the empty spot. So the next question that I think of, the way my brain works is, so why are we all searching and looking for something? Why do we all feel like we have this empty spot in our heart? And listen, I've talked to enough people about the Lord to realize not everybody agrees with me. I get that. And I'm, and I'm really okay with that. I don't expect everybody to believe me. But I do know that everybody's looking for the answer. And I do, I believe I found it. I'm convinced that I found it. That's why I do, that's why I do what I do. Because I have seen in the midst of darkness, in the midst of the night, and the midnight hour, whenever there was pain and there was heartache, much of it my own doing, that the Lord did show up. See, and I'm just like, night, get off of me, He's trying to get off of me, nighttime, get off of me, darkness. And the Lord's like, I'm holding on to you, Matt. But what I need you to do, Matt, is I need you to come to the place in your life where you will quit looking over here, looking over there, looking at that, and you will realize that my hand is on your shoulder and that you will turn around and you will embrace my hand. I'm holding on to you, but will you 
hold on to me. Now, I need you to understand that there's a big old world out there. Okay, I don't even know why I'm getting into all this because I just want to try to explain some things to you. There's a big old world out there with a lot of different opinions. And I happened to be watching <laughs> something like, well, I was watching, I'm just going to be real with you. I was watching a UFC fight. Okay, well, do what you want with that. I was watching a UFC fight, and, you know, I started thinking about this. There was a guy that was a Russian that was, that was obviously, I mean, I study a lot of different things, so I try to become familiar with things, that was obviously from the Eastern Orthodox Church over there in Europe. Now, you might have just happened to show up in here today, and your background may be Catholicism. I wasn't planning any of this. I'm not trying to beat up nobody's beliefs. That's not what I'm trying to do. I was born and raised Catholic. I went to catechism, and so basically I can talk about it if I want to. But nevertheless, I'm just trying to say that so many times in South Louisiana, when we see people that are practicing Catholicism, at least people in churches like ours, we automatically start thinking negatively on anything that we see with Catholicism. I'm just being real. And why would we do that? Just in case you did happen to show up here and you, are, you were raised Catholic like I was, because the Bible doesn't say anything about praying to Mary. Period. Done deal. If you read, read the Bible, it doesn't say anything about that. It doesn't say anything about praying to saints. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, the Apostle Paul told Timothy, there's one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. And so that means we're supposed to be going through Jesus to get to the Father. Jesus said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That means you're not going any other way, and you're not going to get there any other way. Okay, but just what my point is is this. Just because you see, just because you see somebody doing the sign of the cross, you, you may automatically think that, oh, that person's Roman Catholic from South Louisiana. They believe in praying to Mary. But guess what? The Eastern Orthodox Church over there, they, they have similar type concepts. But what is my point? My point is, is that there's a whole big old world out here of people that truly are embracing the ways of God. And, and I saw this guy that, that got down there, and I thought to myself, and because he was giving glory to God too, okay, is the point that I'm trying to make. And I started thinking, you know, people's cultural differences, people's cultures are so different. Like, but there's a big world of people that do want to live for God. And the main point that I guess I'm trying to make is, is this, is that that Russian dude did not have to, whether or not you think people ought to be giving glory to God for beating somebody else up or not, I get that. But I'm just trying to make a point. This guy was giving glory to God in his own way. Does that, that, I don't know anything more about this, dude. It just made me think about a big old world with a lot of people out there that are truly serving God. Like, in other words, what I'm trying to tell you is this. I'm not saying he was because I don't know him. But, what, but I do know this. Like in Syria, a couple of years ago, they had people over there, and they were of, they, they pro you would probably say, well, I mean, I don't even think people that go to that kind of church would be true believers, but yet they refused some of these people to relinquish their faith, and they were burned alive because of their faith and their refusal to reject Jesus Christ. And so the point that I'm trying to make is this, is that while there are a lot of people in the world that might see things differently than you and I, there are also a lot of people in the world that are truly born again, truly born again believers. And that, I just wanted to kind of use that. I know I use a lot of information to get there, but to make the point that God is revealing himself to human beings. As a matter of fact, that's what God, if, if God is real, can we use that conjunction? You know, I say that all the time. Not everybody agrees with me. If God is real and his word is really revealing who he is, then he has a plan, and his plan is to, according to the word of God, his plan is to reveal himself to human beings and to get them to the place where they will be willing to give their lives to him. He's not interested in dead, dry religion. He's not interested in going through the traditions that we learn from our mothers and our fathers and our grandparents. He's not interested in all of that cultural stuff. He's interested in people having a true relationship with him. How do you know such a thing, preacher? Because the word of God says that if God is real, that he sent his only begotten son to die naked on a cross. He hung on a cross for your sin and for my sin. That's what the word of God says. That's pretty serious. Yeah. 
If it's not a fable, if it's not a fairy tale, which I know it's not, but just in case you're not convinced on video or wherever you might be, I got to encourage you to let you know that if this story is real, God has proven his part. He is committed, hallelujah, to having you, uh, to, to having you as a, in a relationship with him. Amen? He's not interested in just the creation part. He's in, because you're already, you're his creation. He wants you to become the children of God. And the way you become the children of God is that you embrace the son that he sent. You see, that, that, it's, you, we need to understand that. Well, why would Jesus have to die on the cross? Because you couldn't. <laughs> I told, I've shared that before where I told that Muslim woman one time, she said, she, said, I, I, she, she was, oh, yeah, but Allah, and I said, Muhammad, and I said, ma'am, I said, look, I respect you, and I said, I appreciate we having this conversation, but you do know that one of us is wrong, right? And she said, yep, and I said, that's exactly right. I said, and this is the thing. Mohammed said this in one of his writings. He said, with one drop of the martyr's blood, all his sin is atoned. I said, ma'am, that's not going to work. Your sin's not going to atone for you. Your blood can't atone for your sin because you have sin in your blood, spiritually speaking. Mohammed, the martyr, can't atone for sin because he, because he has sin in his blood. I can't atone for my own sin because I'm born of Adam, born in sin. That's why God the Father sent his only begotten son who had no sin. Because the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Why do you talk about sin, preacher? Nobody else talks about sin. Yeah, other people talk about sin, but not that many people talk about sin. Why do you? Because sin is the problem. Sin is the problem that we have. Well, why? Well, you're beating me up. You're making me feel. Ain't nobody beating you up because I'm here to tell you I'm the chief of sinners. That's what the apostle Paul said. You don't even want to know nothing about me and my past and how I rolled. And still today, sometimes the things that I think and the ways that I respond, Lord, help me. Okay, so we're all in the same boat. So don't take that from this message. Oh, I don't like that preacher because he didn't do nothing but point out my sin. No, we point out the sin of the human race and the problem that it causes with our relationship with God. All right, so now with all of that said, in this Isaiah passage, I want you to know that just to kind of introduce you to my message, he's describing society around 700 B.C. So many of you already understand the way that I typically teach the Bible. I try to talk about the Bible in a big picture kind of way because God's got a plan that he's doing on the earth. And then within that, our individual lives come together in that. And the reason why that's important to me is because I have personally noticed a shift change take place within the church. Now, I'm going to be real with you. Anybody that's been in the faith for any length of time, Robert would remember this, and Wade would probably remember this too. Back um, probably about 15 years ago, there was a lot of talk that was going on about a paradigm shift. Y'all remember, you remember that terminology, the paradigm shift? And I was like, what? Because we used that word in nursing school, paradigm. It, was, it would be like a, a way that you would do something. Kind of like a, a formula or a way that you would do something. Like if you had like a plan to how you would you do a re-roof a roof from start to finish or whatever it is that you do in your life. You had like a formula set event. We have a paradigm of the way we do service. And so, so they were saying that there was a paradigm shift that was taking place within the church. Now the end result of that paradigm shift was the seeker sensitive movement. And what the seeker sensitive movement basically wanted to do was it didn't want us to talk about sin or the blood. It didn't want us to talk about anything that was going to make people feel uncomfortable about themselves because if we do that, they might not want to come back next week. Okay, they might not want to give money in the offering. I could care less about any of that. No, no, that's not true. I want you to come back next week. I really do want you to come back next week, but not. Not at the mercy of having to dilute the truth of God's word. Yeah. Not, not just to placate somebody to make them feel good. See, the Bible says in the end days, people will heap to themselves piles of preachers because they have itchy ears. And in the King James, if you break it down in the Greek, the idea is they want to hear pleasant words. See, people want to hear pleasant words. I'm just being real with you. And I mean, hopefully, you know, you don't let my personality irritate you to where you don't want Jesus. But, you know, 
you watch somebody like, and you know, oh, here he goes. He's going to start picking on people. Look, you watch somebody like Joel Osteen on TV. Joel Osteen can't even say to Larry King that Mormons and Christians aren't the same thing. I got a problem with that, church. Listen, Mormons believe that, that Jesus and Lucifer are brothers. That's a problem. Joel, you need to do your research, and you need to man up, sir. Joel doesn't want to say, oh, that, you know, that, oh, well, I can't say that homosexuality. I'm not trying to pick on homosexuals. That's not even what I want to do because Lord knows they got their thing and I've had my thing and you got your thing. But, but to say that it's okay to continue on in any kind of a lifestyle that is sinful. I'm talking about, look, dude, if you got a problem with internet pornography, you need to get your heart right because the word of God says that that's a problem. If you got a problem with anything that's contrary to the word of the Lord, then you may be in bondage to that and that's why the night is is trying to hold on to you and the Lord saying I'm holding on to you I need you to turn around and grab a hold of my hand hallelujah because I want to set you free I need you to understand that and this been going on since the beginning in the garden and the fall of man and the sinfulness of man and so part of what I want you to know is in Isaiah there's a story behind that so we're talking about the big picture of God that there was a time when there was no nation that belonged to God. If, if you look at the biblical history, and I mean, if you use the Bible as a history book, and you look, you realize that there was a time when there were individuals that knew God, but there wasn't a nation that belonged to God. There's a lot of information to get to that point. We're not going to go through it. But yet God called a man, and I've shared this many times, named Abraham. And the fast version is that God, through Abraham, created a nation. He created, Abraham had a son named Isaac, and Isaac had a son, two sons, and one of them's name was Jacob, and then later God changed Jacob's name to Israel, and it's through the 12 tribes of Israel that God made the nation of Israel, and it's through Israel that God gave the world Messiah, his name being Jesus, who was born of the virgin, hallelujah, of incorruptible seed. And the whole plan to creating this nation called Israel was to give the world Messiah. And God, through the nation of Israel, used them as a light in the midst of a darkened world to communicate to those other nations around them that there was a real God. you got to understand a world. See, you and I, we sit back in this luxury of our American life. And look, I love my country. I do. I mean, I've gone through a lot of different stages, but I'm so glad. I've been to a lot of places, my friend. I've turned 10 in Singapore. I've been to Europe. I've been to Venezuela. I've been to Mexico. All those places are cool. I'd love to go back. But guess what? I ain't so, I'm so glad I'm not a Singaporean citizen. I'm so glad that I'm not a Venezuelan. I'm so glad that I'm an American, okay? But at the same time, look, I need you to understand that we have become spoiled on the soils of America. We take, we take knowing Jesus for granted, <laughs> There's been times in the world where the world was in the midst of darkness and the world is still in much spiritual darkness because of deception. So God's plan, according to his word, is to bring people to himself, to have a relationship and to reveal himself to humanity. And that's how he chose to do it. He chose to create a nation and through that nation to give the world Jesus. And so whenever I preach the big picture of God, I always like people to know, when you, I, this is just the simple way that I, that I view it. Israel is like an older brother. Christian is like a younger brother. Does that make sense? So you see, I actually used to know two kids in Lafayette when I was growing up, and the older brother's name was Israel, and the younger brother's name was Christian. But Israel as a big people group were the people of God, and Christian as an individual is the people of God. Okay, and so it, the plan is the same. God is wanting to reveal himself to a lost and dying world. God wants to reveal himself to those that are without hope and without help. God wants to reveal himself to people that do not really know him. And just because we know him here does not mean that we know him here. And listen, just because you know him here and just because we say that we're Christians doesn't mean that we really are. Look, every year they do a Gallup poll. I've told you all this before. It's usually the numbers run about the same. 85% of Americans say that they're, they're Christian. And they say that because their mama and their daddy claimed that as their religion. 
But most of these people are not truly Christian. Yes, they believe. Many people in their mind intellectually would say, yeah, I think I do believe that. I think I, think I believe that there was a man named Jesus. And, I mean, I heard he was a Jew, and I heard that he died on two pieces of wood outside a city called Jerusalem. I mean, I believe that. I, I even believe that he probably died for my sin. Okay, yeah, I'm good with that. Okay, but they've never allowed that knowledge to go from here to here. See, that's a faith thing that has to happen. See, when the faith thing happens and you accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, just like God made, created Israel as a nation and they were to serve him, that's the big trick. Not, not the trick, but that's the big pivot point. Where are we going to serve him? Because, see, we can have people that sit in a building like this that say, hey, man, I believe Jesus is real. That's why we actually showed up here this morning. And that's good. It's a good start. But how do you live your life Monday through Saturday? And I'm not trying to talk about perfection. I'm not trying to talk about that you never make a mistake. Give me a break. We all, none of us have arrived. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. I'm just trying to make a point. Are you Choosing to be a servant of the Lord. What, what, what do you, what do you, I mean, what does that even mean, preacher? Okay, I'll tell you what. The servant of the Lord isn't out there on the street trying to pick something up. <laughs> the servant of the Lord, when he engages in conversations, is not trying to scheme somebody, take money out their pocket, uh, cheating on their taxes. Oh, I'm, I'm just going to be real with you. I'm going to try to call it out for you. The servant of the Lord doesn't use, he has choice words. He does. He has choice words, but they're not the ones that most of the world uses. Like, you might even think he's weird, but he might say, praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is good. What are you trying to say, preacher? I got to start going to work. and say, You don't do nothing that I say. You let the Lord do the work in your heart, and then you see whenever the Lord starts living on the inside of you, if the words don't change, if the motives don't change, if the desires of your heart don't change because, see, when you get born again, when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart. He changes things. And that's what I need you to know this morning. More than anything, you and I need God to change us on the inside. You ain't changing yourself, my friend. I'm not changing myself, but the Lord is more than capable to change us and to change our hearts, to change our minds. So there was a great during the time frame of Isaiah, about 700 B.C., there was a lot of confusion and chaos during, the, during these time frames of the children of Israel. By this time, and not to get into it too deep, but the kingdom had split, like the nation itself. It's, it's just a little small, you know, isthmus, I mean, just like a little long piece of land. I'm not going to, I guess I could draw it up here, huh, for you. I know, yeah, y'all just bear with me here. We'll, let, we'll just draw it real quick, just to show you kind of like, if, if you had to, if you were going to draw a picture of Israel, you got the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, the Dead Sea, and then over here you got like the Tigris and the Euphrates, so that's Iraq. It's just a little, this is Israel. The Mediterranean Sea's over here. It's just like a little sliver of land that God gave to people that he created out of nobody, okay? And, and so here they are, but at some point in time, because of disobedience, really King Solomon, I don't want to get into it too deep, the, the kingdom has split from the, in, into the north and the south, okay? And so there was a big split that had taken place, and God uses the prophets as like he uses a preacher to speak the truth to his people. He wants people that are willing to hear. Jesus said, he that has ears, let him hear. So if you have ears that are functioning this morning, that's bigger than just being able to hear sound waves. That means a willingness to hear and to respond by faith. Amen? And, and so what, what I want you to know is, is that this, this nation of Israel had been split in two, and the reason why was because of disobedience. Because Israel, God's people, and we'll see that he created for himself were rebelling against him. And really, if you break it down, you could say it like this. They were beginning to live their lives like everybody around them. See, this is an age-old problem that God's people have, where they become influenced by the world around them. One of the first things that had to happen 
<laughs> I know it's, it may not be funny to you, but it's funny to me. They used to call me Fat Matt the River Rat. One of the first things that Fat Matt the River Rat had to do when he truly got saved was he had to determine in his heart, if I go back over there, it ain't nothing but trouble over there. I went back a couple of times, and by God's grace, I was, I was going for a different purpose. I wasn't going for the old purposes. And by God's grace, I was able, for the most part, to make it through. But this is the thing. Whenever you get born again, whenever you get saved, the Bible says that the old man that you were before you were born again dies. And that a new man is resurrected to newness of life. That means that if the old man starts to want to go back and do the old things, then you can resurrect the old man and you end up again like a weekend at Bernie's. You're carrying your dead man around instead of moving forward in the new life that Jesus wants to give you. And so that's what Israel was doing. God had called them. God had made a nation for them, but yet they were being influenced by the nations around them, right? Can I just be real with you? And listen, and I can talk about it really all I want to because I know because I've lived there, so I have permission. I'm talking to you about my own life. If I say something you don't like, I didn't do it on purpose. I have been, I have spent an inordinate amount of time as a young man in darkened bar rooms. I'm telling you right now, you let the Lord save you and pull you out of that, and then you go back to that. Let me know how that works for you, because it's happened to me. I've already been there. I've already done that. I've already shared with you that God spoke to me in the midst of a bar room. But I'm telling you right now, when the Lord pulls you out and you go back in there, the darkness that's in that place. Dude, you can feel, if you can't feel it, then you might not be saved. Because when you get saved and the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of you, you become sensitive to things of darkness. Because the Holy Spirit is saying, I, ain't, I don't like hanging out here. I, this is not where I dwell. This is in the land of the dark. Uh, no, come to the light. Come to the light because that is where I dwell. And that's what God would draw us, right? But Israel is falling prey and it's caused a split in the kingdom. And it's caused all kind of chaos. And, and now the prophet is saying, listen, the northern kingdom is about to be taken bondage. And he begins to prophesy to the southern kingdom, Judah. And he begins to deliver a message. And that his message was that they should trust in God. They have to trust in God because, see, God had promised them a kingdom. And that's a big part of true Christianity. Well, and, you know, people would say, well, that's your interpretation. Well, no, it's the Bible's interpretation. I know you got to trust me just as much as you got to trust somebody else. I'm, I have no ulterior agenda. I'm here to just try to tell you the best way that I can what God's word is saying and that God has a message, amen, to trust in him and that he has a plan for this earth and for the people on this world, really, is what I'm trying to say. And the plan has to do with the fact that you, you don't have but a little short period of time. James called it a vapor. That means that God's people that are truly born again or have the Spirit of God dwelling with them and leading and guiding them are going to come to the realization of his word that says that his people live their lives differently than the world around them. You got to understand that. The, the people of God, are, are, there's, you cannot argue that. You, there's no way that you can argue that point. If you've read the Bible, you can't. If you've read the Bible, you cannot argue the point that God expects his people to look different, act different, and live differently than the world around them. Well, what, what are you trying to say? Preacher, because he, the Bible says it. He said he, he gave them the right of circumcision, Israel I'm talking about, and it made them look different than the world around them. We could get into a lot of detail, but just understand me. He gave them the law. He gave them the tabernacle. He gave them all the religious rituals that were all pointing to Jesus. And he gave them that to make them look different than the nations around them. The nations around them were doing weird stuff. Stuff, though, that makes the flesh feel good. I'm just being real with you. Like the ancient times, these people were engaging in, they, they, would, use, they would use various types of drugs. And I'm looking, I'll tell you right now, I'll be the first to admit to you that I've had a past in my life that I was a mess. Okay, but they were using it 
the whole world around there, they were under the influence of demonic spirits. They would use various types of drugs, and then they would have sexual encounters, and that's how they worship these false gods. Now, you know that that, I mean, I'm being kind of silly, but it's not really not funny, but to kind of lighten it up a little bit, it's probably a little bit easier to get people to come to that kind of church than it is whenever, because, because see, the flesh, when the flesh is enticed, the flesh wants that, because it makes the flesh feel good. Okay, but I'm here to tell you that God's people are supposed to look different than the world. Amen. And that the way that that happens is that a man or a woman truly gets born again. And when the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of their heart. And this is the thing, too. God will, he's merciful with us. When the night is holding on to you, God is holding on. And he's being merciful. And he's continuing to draw you and I by his presence. But don't be, God will not be mocked. Whatever, when a man sows to the flesh, of the flesh he shall also reap. If you sow flesh seed, you will reap a flesh harvest. And so therefore, quit, quit being, let's quit being confused. And what I mean is, why is all this stuff going on? We, we throw, we're sowing flesh seed. <laughs> why should we be confused? We ain't really serving the Lord. I mean, I'm just saying we people in general. Whenever they find themselves in the midst of situations and circumstances, many times they're like, why is all this stuff happening? It shouldn't be that confusing. That's what was going on in Israel's life. Many times people believe they're serving the Lord, but they're not really serving after the Lord. I'm not trying to talk about that you're living a life that doesn't have failures and that you don't have mistakes. I'm talking about a mindset that says, I am a child of God and I am going to live for the Lord. That's what I'm trying to get across to you this morning. Amen. So, so Isaiah's message was that they were to trust and, and hope in the Lord. But in, that, in those first couple of verses that I read to you in Isaiah 43, uh, verses 1 and 2, some of the words that kind of stuck out to me was that God said that he created them. You see there? He, I created you. And then he, he, and he says, I created you, Jacob. And then he says, and I formed you, Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I want you to see that word, redeemed. Okay? I have called you by your name. You are mine. And so one of the things that I want you to know is, is that God as a creator, there's a, this is an Old Testament passage, but there's a New Testament truth connected to this. That's what it really means to be born again. I want you to know that this morning. The Bible teaches that to be born again means that there's a recreation taking place. What are you talking about? Well, what I'm trying to say is, is that what he's saying to Israel is this. There was no nation, and I created you. I created you when I called a man named Abraham out. He had a son named Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob, and Jacob is a type of the first birth. What are you talking about? When you were born the first time from your mother, you were born with a sinful nature like your father, Adam. But when you do get born again... In the mind of God, you just got to take my word for this. This comes out of Romans. This comes out of Galatians. This comes out of Colossians. In the mind of God, whenever you put your faith in Christ, in the mind of God, the old man that was born of Adam dies with Jesus, is buried with Jesus, and a new man is resurrected to newness of life. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that those that are in Christ Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It essentially says you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. So what does that mean? That means when you get saved and born again, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of your heart. And it means the Holy Spirit starts to change the desires of your heart. He begins to separate you out from the places that you used to go. You don't need me to tell you what to do. I mean, I'm going to do my best to give you the word, but the Holy Spirit will immediately begin to tell you right from wrong. Amen? And so he says, I created you, Jacob. And then he says, I formed you, O Israel. That's one of the things I want to talk to you about for just a, because see, the word created means beginnings or birth. And I want you to know that for the New Testament Christian, there's a new birth in Christ whenever you get born again. But that word formed in the idea of the Hebrew, you know what it is? It's like a potter with his clay. You know, a potter with his clay, and he's forming, and he's molding. And there's so many, there's so much rich thematic material within the Word of God that talks about a potter with his clay. And even in the book of Proverbs, sometimes the craftsman that's working with metals, 
and that he'll apply fire to the metal to remove the impurities because ultimately he's looking to make a vessel that's worthy for him. And you see, the, pot, the, the, the craftsman, the silversmith, and the potter, they know exactly what's in there, right? God knows what's in us. And God allows things to take place in the midst of our life because he wants to form us. Amen. And the miracle of God creating Israel and separating them for himself is similar to the church's separation of people today in Christ. One day there was no nation, and then all of a sudden through Abraham there was. And one day a person is not serving God, and then all of a sudden they embrace the Lord through faith. And guess what? And now they are. They're serving him. Their walk may not look like mine. Their walk may not look like yours. But they're moving in a direction away from where they used to be and moving towards where God desires to bring them. One of the scriptures that I was thinking about with, when it comes to this is, is this. I'm talking about forming now. Okay, So God creates a new, uh, a new creation in Christ. But look, I wanted you to see this. It's, it, this, this scripture right here says that being confident of this very thing. He, that's talking about God, which began a good work in you, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So what I need you to understand is this, is that when you first get saved, what does it mean to even get saved? Well, this is maybe a simplified version. I'm not trying to give you some magical prayer, but you got to come to the realization that you're a sinner and that your sin has separated you from God. And you got to believe God's plan that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for your sin. And that also the Bible says you need to believe that God raised him from the dead. And the reason that Jesus raised from the dead was because he had no sin. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Because see the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. But because Jesus had no sin, there was no penalty for him to pay for his own sin. So therefore, death had no right to hold him in the grave. And so it was inevitable. Jesus was coming out of the grave. He was going to resurrect from the dead because death, hell, and the grave had no right over him. The good news is, is that those that are found in him, Jesus told Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that comes to me, though he might die, he will live, he will never die. See, there's a, there's a spirit, there's a, re, a there's going to be a physical resurrection, but I need you to know this. God will bring you alive from the dead today. Spiritually speaking, whatever that thing is in your heart and in your life that the night is trying to hold on to you, I need you to know that it's not more powerful than God who wants to reveal himself. And, and Paul said, I am confident. Of this very thing, that he that began a good work in you, he will accomplish it. He will perform it. He will mold you like a potter does with clay. He will mold you into him, his image and his likeness. You know, some people are like, oh, man, that, that preacher's, you know, I know I say this and my jokes get old. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, that preacher's brainwashing you, man. No, I don't call it brainwashing. I call it washing your brain. Okay, there's always a little angle to look at. You're not being brainwashed, you're washing your brain. What are you trying to say? When the word of God comes in like water to cleanse, now you see you're being enculturated to a, on a whole different level. Reenculture, that's right, I said it, I love that word. Reenculturate me, Lord. What, what, what are you trying to say? I mean, this is biblical. I, I don't have time to get into it, but in Hebrews 3 and 4, the writer says, my children do always err, for they do not know my ways. I mean, that's, that's kind of important. My children always err. In other words, my children are always walking in error. Why are they doing that, God? Because they don't know my ways. Why your own children, God, don't know your ways? Because he was talking about Israel. He said, they wandered in a wilderness, and they didn't know me, and they kept putting me to the test. Why they didn't know your ways? And I thought about this. Because, see, the children of Israel were Egyptian slaves for 400 years. And we, as the people of God, we, 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 how long did we live in the world? Like, really, I mean, I don't know what your story is. I mean, I didn't live in the world that long, but let me tell you something. That world tried to hold on to me for a long time once I gave my heart to God. All right, and so, and so the world had kind of like raised me. I'm just saying, like, between my mama's family, I know I share that a lot, they playing cards and drinking all night, and daddy's over there, like, 
getting drinking and getting in fights and cussing and hollering and screaming and it's like a Jerry Springer show and you grow up in that and you find friends that do the same thing you do and you start drinking and doing whatever with them and you're getting in trouble and and then you know and, and and all of these things the music is molding us and all of these things in life and I'm just trying to say do you do you understand the picture am I making it clear what I'm trying to say that people even that say that they love God, if you're still living that way, something ain't right. I'm not trying to say you don't make mistakes. I'm not trying to say when you make mistakes, the Lord deals with your heart. That's a good sign. As a matter of fact, a young person, we had that little Bible study the other night, and one of the young people said, how do you know you're saved? And I had already written down on my notebook the word conviction. See, when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart. And when the Holy Spirit lives in your heart and you continue to try to do something that, was, that you used to do that's, that's against God's word, the Holy Spirit will begin to deal with your heart and he will show you that that's not his will and you will become convicted by God. That doesn't mean condemned to a devil's hell. It means the Holy Spirit is revealing to you. Dude, that's a beautiful thing. I mean, listen, if God is real then I want to have that kind of relate. I want to know him. <laughs> you know, I hope you didn't come to church this morning just to go through the motions. Oh, let me do a couple of homina homina and get up and, and, and roll out, and I did my little religious whatever. No, like, I mean, I got other things I could do if, God, if, if, if I don't believe it's real. Yeah, I got, there's other things that we could be doing, okay? The question is, are we a servant of the Lord or not? And that's between you and God, to determine that, God will reveal that to your heart. Amen? So God it wants to perform it, and what that means is he wants to bring it to an end. He wants to accomplish it. But you know, many times, the forming that a potter does requires tearing down what is already there in order to start over again. God's got to tear down some mindsets. God's got to tear down some thoughts. Oh, no, this isn't really all that bad. No, 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 no. Sometimes whenever the clay on the wheel gets askew, then the potter has to just squash it down and start all over again. And many times in our own hearts and in our own lives, that's the kind of thing that's going on, right? The things of the world try to grab a hold of us and destroy us, and they don't want to let us go. And God will bring us through a process where he will allow us to be torn down so that he can form us into his image. Amen. Israel's journey would include rivers to cross and fires. But you know what he said? He said, You're not, the river's not going to overwhelm you. The fires are not going to burn you. And I want you to know that God will allow obstacles in your life and in your pathway. Right? But his desire is not that you get drowned by these things. God does not want you to be overwhelmed. To get, you get burnt. And you, get, you get drowned. No. God through the frustrations of these obstacles, this is important, I believe, through the frustrations of these obstacles and the grace mixture together will bring us to a place of surrender. See, God has a way of convincing us. You, you understand what I'm saying? There are certain things, again, that make our flesh feel good, certain things that we like, certain things that we're actually holding on to in the midst of the darkness of night, and God's got his hand on our shoulder, but we're looking forward and holding on to this, and the whole time he's whispering, and he's saying, okay, well, let's throw this other little speed bump in the way. Let's throw this other little pothole in the way. Let's let this other little thing happen in the midst of your life, because I'm trying to get your attention, and I'm trying to get your eyes to turn to me, because see, the clay is looking all kind of discombobulated, and we're about to, we need to just kind of start this all over again. Amen? <clears throat> the, my, my New Testament passage for that is comes out of Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12 verse 1 and it says, wherefore seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. What does that mean? That means there's been a lot of people in the Old Testament, a lot of people in the New Testament that have already gone before us and they've lived their life for God. There's a cloud of witnesses. In other words, this may not make a whole lot of sense to somebody that just kind of showed up or whatever the case or somebody watching on video that just kind of showed up. But again, I've already said it a hundred times this morning. God's got a people that he's calling 
that belong to him, that he created, O Jacob, that he formed, O Israel. And he, this is his people on the earth, and those people are, are, are witnesses to his goodness. Amen? And he says, listen, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finish of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, look, if you talk to people that don't really believe in God, many people believe that, that somebody just created religion to try to, like, corral people. You know what I'm saying? You gotta, we got to keep the masses at bay. Okay, we don't want them going off. So we'll tell them that there's a God and we'll give them some rules and they'll act a little, act a little bit better. But, but see, if you, never, if you don't believe that God is real and if you don't, if you don't have a desire to, let, to have God in your heart and in your life, then, then you're going to continue to believe that the things that you do are fine. And, and what the Bible is saying is this, is that those things in our life, they, they, they can mess up our, the race. They can mess up the walk. They, they, they cause frustration. They cause us to trip up. But we have the author and the finisher of our faith is Jesus and that he endured the cross. You know, one of the things that, uh, that I want you to, to know is this, is that God uses all these things in our life. I'm not going to turn to every scripture, but in Romans 8, 28 and 29, it says, For God causes all things to work together for good to them that love God. So no matter what you're going through right now and what you're facing or what you faced in your past, God won't waste it. If you will give God the opportunity, he won't waste the things that you've been through in the past. Part of what he'll do with those obstacles and those, and those weights and those sins that have been in your past is he will use them to convince you that you don't want to live that way anymore. If you're anything like me, though, sometimes it's hard for God to get a hold of us. Can I be real with you? Is it okay if we're honest this morning? It was, it was difficult for God to convince me. But by his grace, I want to be convinced. Because I don't want to just sit here and waste my life. Amen. I want to live for the Lord. Amen. And, and so I want you to know that God will all use those struggles. And sometimes in the midst of those struggles that we're going through, we can feel like we're alone. But the word of God says that he'll never leave us or forsake us. I want you to know that he said in this passage of scripture, the rivers won't overflow you, the fires won't burn you. Angie preached it last week. The Hebrew boys didn't get burned in the furnace. Daniel didn't get eaten in the lion's den. God wants to be there with us to get us through. He's not going to forsake his people. He said that in Deuteronomy. He said that he told Moses, he said that he be strong, be of good courage. He said, for I will not fail you. I will neither forsake you. And I, he said, don't be dismayed. And the word dismayed there means don't be discouraged. Don't be beaten down. I want to encourage you this morning. Maybe you're going through some things and you feel discouraged and you feel beaten down. But listen, there's hope in the Lord. I want you to know that. Amen? And I mean, I, I want the Lord to convince you of that. Because I can't. I, am, I, can, I, I say it all the time. I mean, I can, I can say it with passion. Amen? And I, mean, and I can mean it. But, but it's got to be the Holy Spirit that gives you the revelation of it. Amen? So in this next few verses, we already read it. But look, he says, you're my witnesses, says the Lord. You're the servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. I'm telling you right now, this is really what God wants to get. He wants to get each and every one of us in this room. Some of you, I'm just saying, like, some people watching on video, they're like, I ain't never clicking on that dude again. Some of y'all that showed up here this morning might say, I ain't never gracing the doors of that church again. But I'm here to tell you, you showed up today, so you're going to get to hear my opinion about what the word God wants to bring every human being on the earth to this place right here where we would be his witnesses. 
witness to the fact that there is no other God upon the earth. Oh, there's a lot of things out there that are trying to get the attention of God's people, but they're not real gods. They're false gods. And God is saying that I have chosen you, I have created you, I have formed you, and I have called you to be my witnesses. You are my chosen People, because I need the world out there to know that I am the one true God. And if they never know that, see, if you don't, if, if you maybe you don't believe the Bible this morning, if you don't believe, then it's easy. I'm just slip on out of here and I have no conviction. But listen, if you believe the Bible, God is saying that He is the real one and He needs people that will change, that He that will allow Him to change them so that they can be witnesses for Him. So that they can let those people know out there who he is. Amen. Listen, we live in the midst of a world that is very similar to the world that was there. Any of, how, most of you, like I'm 55. So those of you that are kind of like my age, you, you know what I'm talking about. Some of you that are a little bit younger, you may still know what I'm talking about. How much has the landscape of this country changed in the last 25 years? There was a time whenever you didn't have to ask the question. Now I ask the question all the time. They're like, oh, I believe in God. And I'm like, which one? Which one do you believe in, sir? Which one do you believe in, ma'am? Because just saying you believe in God doesn't mean anything anymore. Do you believe in the one who sent his son to die on the cross for your sin? Let's clarify this. Okay, because now America, see, America, they said, well, America is not a Christian nation. Didn't one of our presidents say that a few years ago? America is not a Christian nation. Yeah, it was Obama. He said that. America is not a Christian nation. Okay, well, guess what? They got a lot of Christians that are living in America. And so what they're doing is they turned it into a melting pot. Listen, you can come. You know what's interesting is you can come over here and you can worship Allah, but if I go over there to Saudi Arabia and try to bow down on my knees to worship Jesus, what they, they're going to try to cut my hands off and my feet off, and they're going to try to do all these other things. Like, what, what in the world is going to... So what I'm trying to say is, is that the, the spirits of the world are trying to convince people that there's many ways to God, and that there's many, there's many gods, and there's many pathways to God, and God's testimony of himself is this. No, I am the only God. There is no other God before me. And God is a jealous God. And God wants people on the earth to know that he is the one true God. And he will not share his glory with another. He's not going to, he, do, he wouldn't then and he's not today. And listen, the Bible says that one day wrath will fall upon this earth. Judgment will fall upon this earth. I'm not saying that to scare anybody. Sca trying to scare people isn't going to keep people in the faith. It's the goodness of God that leads a man to repentance. God will, give, through his goodness, lead you to repentance. Amen? He will contend with you. He will love on you. And he will deliver you. And when he does, you're going to want to serve the Lord. You know what I'm saying? You are going to want to serve the Lord. Amen? You know, we all need to be reminded that God wants us to live in victory. So don't be beaten down and discouraged, Christian. God will not leave you or forsake you. He will not let you drown or be burned. Amen? He will get you to the right place. Amen? All right. So I'm going to close with this concept here. You all ready? Verses 18 and 19. Because this is the, really where the title of my message comes from. Remember not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. It shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Amen? So I want you to be reminded of the fact that God, and when God was telling Israel this, he's, he's really talking about his big plan in the future. He's got kind of like an intermediate plan, but he's also got a long-term plan. Because, see, Israel that he created, like I told you, has now been in disobedience to him and is now coming under bondage. And what, he's, and what Isaiah is saying is, listen, you're about to go into captivity. You're about to go into captivity, and they did. The history says that they went into captivity for like 70 years. And many times for you and I and our walk with God, we go into a spiritual captivity. But God wants you and I to understand that he has, a new, he has something for us to look forward to. And what he's saying in this passage of Scripture, see, sometimes people will use this the wrong way. And they'll be like, oh, God's going to do something new. Like, yeah, I, I, you know, and, and, and even in the church, I'm not fussing at people. I'm just trying to make a point. Even in the church, you got people that will be like, 
you know, man, I'm, I'm serving the Lord, but this just didn't work out. So, you know, I divorced my wife, and, and, uh, and now, guess what? Man, God's about to do something new in me. <laughs> God's about to do something new. And what they're thinking, I'm just being real with you because I, I know how the human mind works sometimes. What they're thinking in their head is, is that, oh, man, the Lord's about to do something new. Oh, the daisies are about to start blooming. He's about to bring a new little honey into my life, and it's all about, or the vice versa. I mean, I got rid of that old plug, and now God's about to give me a new man. And this new man, that, that's not what the Lord's talking about. Now, am I trying to say that there's the possibility that you gave your heart to the Lord and that your husband was abusing you and whatever the case, and, and you, had right, you had the right that the Lord wanted to deliver you out of that and that part of God's plan for your life is that you find a new uh, husband in the future that's a spiritual man that loves the Lord. Yeah, that's a possibility. But what I'm trying to talk about is how people think in their mind. Oh, God's about to do a new thing. And, and, they, and they, they, they focus it all on themselves. Does that make sense? This like, man, this word is for me. God's about to do a new thing and it's all about me. Well, first of all, I need you to know this, is that God, what he's saying here is, First of all, I'm about to do a new thing. I'm about to get you up out of here. It might not be for another 70, 80 years, but I'm about to get you up out of here, and I'm about to bring you to, the, to a new place that I have for you. And I'm going to do an even newer thing in the end of days because I'm about to bring a new heavens and a new earth. So what I need you to know is this. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, all right, God wants to do a new thing. And the new thing may be a new relation, part of it, I'm just saying, may be a new relationship, might be a new financial thing, might upgrade your job, might give you a promotion, might, it might involve all of those things. But I guarantee you one thing, if you get all of that stuff happening in your life, it's going to be because, and if it's God's will, it's going to be because you're focused on the will of the Lord and the decisions that you're making are not just about what's going to please you or what you want in your flesh. But as a servant of God, you're going to be mindful and focused on the things of God. And as you're functioning in that way, God will begin to meet your needs and he will begin to bring forth new things in your heart and in your life. Amen. Hey, listen, maybe the musicians could come up here and We'll close out this service, amen, with worshiping the Lord. But I just wanted to leave you this morning and to remind you that God does want to do a new thing. And he did. He did a, he did a new thing when he sent us Jesus. And he provided a new covenant. And I want you to, real quick before I stop talking and they start singing, I want you to know that one of the promises of the new covenant is that when you and I come to the realization that we're sinners and we embrace Jesus and what he did for us on the cross and we ask forgiveness of our sins, the new covenant teaches that the spirit of God comes to live on the inside of us. That's the game changer. That's the real, that's the real change. So if you've never been born again, you can be born again this morning. Amen. You can come up here for prayer and I'll be, I'd love to pray with you and lead you in a prayer. But you don't even have to come up here. You could be watching on video. You could be sitting in your chair. I ran up to the altar when I got saved. But, you know, look, things are different. Everybody's different. And, but, but I do want you to say this. You do have to invite Jesus into your heart. You do have to recognize that you have sin in your life. And you do have to want to be forgiven of your sin. And when you ask the Lord to forgive you of your sin and to come in, God knows when you mean it from your heart. There's a difference from praying it in your head versus praying it from your heart. And when you mean it from your heart, he hears you and he knows that it's true. And if you will receive him, he will come to live on the inside of you. And I promise you, your life will never be the same. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's worship the Lord this morning.